Thank you very much for that. Good. So uh, we want to proceed with this example, or we want to, or you can work on that example at home if you want. Just give it a try. Um, or we want to go ahead with um, practice the uh, uh, functions. Functions? Okay. So in that case, we are right now in section 4.5. And I cannot forget to show you sl uh, slant asymptotes. We we did this we did this in precap, of course. And I'm still zoomed in. Okay. Oh, oh, that's what they were saying. Actually, you were saying something else. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is section Yes in which everything is put together now, including L'Hopital's rule. So in 4.5, on page 317, uh, let's choose a couple of problems, and then we'll talk about the slant asymptote. Number 9. OK, we want to start with number 9. That's fine. Number 9 is a very nice example. We already know this graph. We can picture it. Um, because of uh, pre-calculus. This was super discussed in pre-calculus. But now let's suppose we don't know anything about it. Okay, let's say we have no idea what this means or, or how the graph will look like. Well, obviously, let's get our, <laughs> bless you, let's get our table started. So this is f prime. In the middle we have f of x and then f double prime. First, we have to start with a domain. Now, again, uh, I think I showed last time. Let me show you again. The book does not summarize the information. It just says it goes from A through H. And then it says, OK, just read this and graph. I don't recommend this method because you're not, uh, how will I know, since f double prime is greater than 0 if x is this, and it's less than 0 if f is that, it's concave up on this, and it's concave down on this, and inflection point this, and it's, it's very difficult. You're going to have all this information on three pages, and then now put it together and graph the function. So if you don't like this table, invent your own, but um, summarize the information somehow. How do I know I'm done when this is completely filled up? Then I know I'm done. The only thing that does not fit here is symmetry of the function, because I have to calculate it separately. But everything else goes in the table. OK, ready? I have to start with the domain. What is the domain of this function? Perfect. So negative infinity, 0 has to be in the table, 1 has to be in the table. And if the function is undefined, so will its derivatives at 1. Now. Uh, I recommend, and you know I write big and I always run out of room, so I recommend present the table on the entire width of your pager, page because uh, some of these problems have a lot, the tables are very dense. You know, so the more room you leave between or allow between um, x values, the better off you are. Okay, so now it's undefined at 1. Let's plug in 0. And that's 0. And I know already that I have to have something here, something here, here, and here. And I'm done about the function. There is nothing else I can find about the function from the function itself. I have to have the limits. And I have to have the limits left and right because I know x equals 1 will be a VA for sure. I can't. I have to use L'Hopital's rule. You can't conclude. Infinity over infinity, you cannot conclude. OK, so let's find the limit of x over x minus 1 with x approaches infinity or negative infinity. This is indeed infinity over infinity, so you will differentiate. So it's 1 over 1, which we knew from pre-calc, because this is a rational function that I like to call type 1. 
which means same degree over same degree. And the horizontal asymptote is the leading coefficient over the leading coefficient, as long as it's type 1. And that's how we know that this is 1. y equals 1 horizontal asymptote. 1 on bo both ends. And now, in order to find these limits, in the past, in pre-calculus, I showed my students to plug in 0.9 and 1.1 in order to find the sign. There is no need now, right? Because this is exactly what we're doing anyway. But we can write the limit this time. So we write the limit as x approaches uh, 1 from the left of x over x minus 1. We know it's 1 over 0. We know there is no hope. And now, still I plug in 0 0.9. And what, do, what sign do I get? Yeah. Very good. I do the same thing with limit of x over x minus 1 as x approaches 1 from the right. And it's still 1 over 0. And I know there is no hope. But when I plug this time 1.1, I get I exhausted everything about the function from the function itself. I can't determine anything else. This is it. X and Y intercepts, it happened to be at the same point. Um, undefined at 1, horizontal asymptote, vertical asymptote, that's it. So now I'm going to find the derivative, see if there are any critical numbers, and study the sign. Then I'm going to find the second derivative and study the sign. And I'm done. Like the derivative is just 1 over 1 and 0 over 0. How do we differentiate a ratio? If there is no limit in front, I can never do that. Right? So it's a quotient rule. OK, please be very careful. That's why I keep saying, because I know it's confusing. Only inside the limit, I can apply that procedure. Top prime over bottom prime. If there is no limit, I cannot ever apply that procedure when I differentiate a quotient. Clear? I know it's confusing. That's why I keep repeating it. So, so um, dy over dx or y prime ratio. Top prime is 1 times the denominator minus the top times the denominator prime over x minus 1 squared. Nice. This is negative 1 over x minus 1 squared. No critical numbers. Because x equals 1 would, could be a critical number, but the function is not defined at 1. So it's not a critical number. Right? Good. So what is the sign of the first derivative? No matter what, always. Negative. Correct. Why? Because this is always positive, but there is a negative in front. This is always positive. 1 is always positive. So all this is always positive, but there is a negative in front. So. Now the moment of truth. I want to make sure that these two rows work well together. Because if they don't, well, I have an error somewhere. So let's see. From 1 to 0, what does the function do? Yes. Does, is that supported by the sign of the first derivative? Yes. Good. From 0 to negative infinity? Good. So obviously, this is the case. Now from infinity to 1. Is that supported? Perfect. OK? It's very clear that at this point, for this particular function, I could skip the second derivative. But let's not. OK, so the first derivative now, I prefer it like this. Every time when the numerator is a constant, I will always change it into a product. Because otherwise, I'll have to say that the derivative of the constant is 0 times this. And I, I truly believe it's easier. But it's up to you. You decide. So then the second derivative will be 2 times x minus 1 to negative 3 times the inner function prime. And now I can go back to this. 
Now I have to be very careful because now the power is 3. For the purpose of the sign of the second derivative, I will write this. Because this doesn't count when it comes to the sign. What is the sign of that first quantity? Yes. So I would, I would, I would not even bother with it. This, however, will give us the sign. But that's easy because it's x minus 1. Linear function with a positive slope for the sign, only for the sign. So it's negative and positive. So negative and positive doesn't hold water. It does hold water. You can say, I don't want your signs. I just want to plug in numbers. Plug in numbers. When you plug in 0, you get negative. When you plug in 5, you get positive. The first part of yes. So once I found the second derivative, I have to study its sign. But I want to be efficient. I don't want to plug in, in something that it's already positive. So I presented this into a product of two quantities. 2 over x minus 1 squared, which doesn't mean anything when it comes to the sign, and 1 over x minus 1. So only x minus 1 gives the sign, uh, gives the sign of the expression called the second derivative. Is that better? So this to the left of 1 is negative, to the right of 1 is positive. Yes, Alec, go ahead. Could we have left it as the third? And, let's see the third and yes, but I'm going to do this all the time when I t uh, study the sign. I will separate what is already positive so I don't worry about it, and I just keep the simple uh, expressions that give the sign. But technically, if, if that's... Yeah, you can plug it in into x minus 3, okay. sure. Uh, to x minus 1 cubed, but then you have to cube it. Right. It's up to you. That's fine. Okay, this is it. And this function is not symmetric. f of x is not symmetric. To be exact, I will write f of negative x does not equal f of x, and it does not equal negative f of x. It's not even, and it's not odd. This means the function is even, symmetric with respect to the y-axis. This means symmetric with respect to the origin or odd. Okay. So an even function is this. If this is x and this is negative x, f of negative x equals f of x, which means the function is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. This is very important. If you don't remember this, I'll rather um, elaborate because this is very important for chapter 5. When we get to integrate uh, even functions and odd functions, this is very important. So if you need me to uh, go back and explain some more, I will. So a function is considered even. In other words, it's, it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. The y -axis. My graph is not perfect, but this is what it means. f of negative x, this is negative here, f of negative x and f of x are the same value right here. This will be f of negative x and this will be f of x. And they are the same for any even function. Now let's also talk about odd functions. And then I'll come back to graph. I didn't forget. So here's an odd function, which is symmetric with respect to the origin. Here's the graph. Can anyone tell us what this is? What graph is this? Very good, of course. x cubed is an odd function because what is the relationship? Um, for this function between f of x and f of negative x. They cannot be the same. They are the same for an even function. But here they're not the same, but there is a specific relationship between the two. 
f of exactly opposites not inverse but opposites correct so such a function will be symmetric with respect to the origin such a function would be respect is um, a symmetric with respect to the y axis even and odd better perfect so now we are ready to graph so when i'm ready to graph i literally do not care about anything else but this nothing else tells me anything so all the information is summarized i have everything in there it's not symmetric all the asymptotes everything when we graph functions with asymptotes we have to graph the asymptotes first so if i we do have a y equal an x equals one and we do have a y equals one so now let's do this together we graphed in pre-calculus more difficult problems than this, if you remember, right? Okay, so from the horizontal asymptote, crosses at the origin and goes down to negative infinity. Opening downward. Decreasing from 1 to, from approaching the horizontal asymptote, crossing at the origin, and approaching negative infinity on the left-hand side of the asymptote. On the other side, it's opening upward, decreasing from infinity to 1. From infinity to 1, opening upward. We did not have this concept in pre-calc. We did not, I was not able to explain to you why it's a, and when it's concave up, upward and downward. Because we did not have the second derivative. So this is the function x over x minus 1. Any questions on this? Any questions? Many of these problems are very dense. They require a lot of work. I think um, we should work on um, a problem that has slant asymptotes now. If, it's, if that's okay with you, I will choose one. Make sure or make one up because I really don't see any here. You could always do like so they have an example. <laughs> oh, I got it on page uh, 318. I just found them. 65 through 70. Please choose. 65 through 70 on page 318. 67. 67. It is. Um, so we have f of x, which is x to the third plus 4, divided by x squared. Uh, it is a very good one. I was going to say it's a very good one, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it's very easy, though. I got scared for a second. Thought it was bad one. Very good one. Okay. So let's discuss um, the three types of rational functions that we can look at. And we can look at more types but in, in this class. But let me just classify them like I do uh, in pre-calculus. Uh, type 1, type 2, nobody knows them by these names. So we're talking about rational functions. rational functions. Type 1 is same degree of the same degree. So degree n over degree n. We had, a minute ago, we had just that example. Same degree of the same degree. What happened? The horizontal asymptote is always the leading coefficient over the leading coefficient. If I had 3, it would have been 3 and 3. If I had 1 over 5, it would have been 1 fifth. So this is type 1. Same degree of the same degree. Type 2 is degree n in the denominator, but here degree uh, less than n. So let's say this is degree 5 and this is degree 2. Or, I'm sorry? 
Say it again. Oh, you mean the horizontal asymptote? F of x equals x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 4. Same degree over same, same degree. degree. But then you said something about 1 over 5 and 1 over 5. You, you just mean if it was the, the, the horizontal asymptote. If I have 1 and 5 here, then this will be 1 fifth and this will be 1 fifth. Leading coefficient over the leading coefficient will be the horizontal asymptote. You still have to determine the limit, so you don't have to memorize this. I'm just showing you the differences. Now here, an example would be x divided by x squared minus 1, in which the degree in the denominator is bigger than the degree in the numerator. What is the difference between these two? Very simple. The horizontal asymptote is always 0 for type 2. And this one is always the, the uh, leading coefficient over the leading coefficient. So if it was 3x squared over minus 1 to 4x squared over... It will be 3 4. fourths. Correct. Okay. Now, this one is degree n plus 1 over degree n. In other words, the numerator, as you see, what is the degree of the numerator? What is the degree of the denominator? Two. Two. So it's exactly by one unit higher at the top. This one will not have a horizontal asymptote. These two have horizontal asymptotes. This one will not have a horizontal asymptote, but a slant. A rational function cannot have horizontal and slant at the same time. If it has horizontal, it cannot have slant. And this is the only one that has a slant asymptote. When I divide degree 5 by degree 3, what do I get? The answer is a line. When I divide degree 3 by degree 2, what do I get? The answer is a line. So every time the ratio, uh, the top has degree one unit higher than the bottom, the answer will always be a line, the quotient of the division will always be a line, okay? A linear function, not just a number. Okay, so this is the, the case that we are facing. The function will have or can have vertical asymptotes that has no connection to having a slant or a horizontal, but this particular one is the only one that has slant asymptotes or slant asymptote. Okay, so I'm going to copy the function, so this one no horizontal asymptote, comma, but slant asymptote. So I'm going to copy the problem one more time. x to the third plus 4 divided by x squared. Here's the reason why this is a very nice example. I will separate, because the denominator is, has one, one term, I will separate it and simplify and now you'll understand why, when I try to determine the limit of this function, which portion, and, and infinities, which portion makes, gives us an answer, and which portion does not? No, this is always zero. When x approaches infinity or negative infinity, this means nothing. The x. And that's the line. That's the horizontal asymptote, the slant asymptote. So this is the slant asymptote. If the denominator, however, does not have just one term, I have to use the long division or synthetic division to find the quotient. That's why this was a very good starting problem. Very good. Because I was able to find the quotient of this division in a blink, right? So I just separated the fraction into x cubed over x squared plus 4 over x squared. At infinity, this is nothing. That's why the, this ratio does not get involved in any way in finding the slant asymptote, just the quotient. This piece means nothing at infinities. Okay, so let's get it started. So we have x, f prime, the function, 
and the second derivative. Let's find the domain of this function. What is a domain? Say it again. Very good. Thank you so much. Bless you. If the function is undefined at 0, obviously the derivatives must be undefined at 0. No question. Good. So obviously x equals 0 is a VA for sure. Don't try to set x cubed um, plus 4 equals 0 before we try to find the cube root of negative 4 and see what that is. So it's a negative number. Let's put it in the calculator because I need to put the x and y intercepts. I cannot plug in 0 in this function. So what do we get by solving x cubed plus 4? Let me write it so I don't confuse anyone. We have to find the x-intercepts. So what I need to find is this. This, 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 and this. And if the function has x-intercepts. So x-intercepts when f of x is 0 and when the top is 0. So x to the third equals negative 4 and we take the cube root of negative 4. Although you can say, wait a minute, this is a polynomial equation and you should be able to find three solutions. True, but only one is real. The other two are imaginary. So in, um, I get this, what do I get? I want negative 4 uh, raised to 1 divided by 3. I got negative 1.59. Approximately negative 1.59. Negative 1.59 and 0. Now when I determine the limit as x approaches infinity from x plus 4 over x squared and you can say, why did you choose this form? Well, we can choose the original form and then ap apply L'Hopital's rule. Or choose this, and it will give us the answer in a blink. If we can choose that, it's going to be the same thing, the same answer. Or you can choose this. This is much easier to determine the limit from. But if you want this, we'll apply L'Hopital's rule twice. Which one? This or that? This one? Yes. Okay, very good. So what is the limit? So then limit as x approaches negative infinity from x plus 4 over x squared. So here we write negative infinity. Here we write infinity. I have to make myself a note. y equals x is a slant asymptote. One more time. How do you... How do we determine the slant asymptote? After we divide the top by the bottom, only the quotient, only the quotient is the slant asymptote because this quantity approaches zero at infinity. So now I need the limits left and right. And I can no longer find anything else about the function from the function itself, and I can go ahead and differentiate. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Okay, so let's find the limit as x approaches 0 from the left from x to the third plus 4 divided by x squared and then limit as x approaches 0 from the right from x cubed plus 4 over x squared. So, when we plug in 0 at the top, what do we get? Perfect. When we plug in 0 at the bottom, we get 0. So what about 4 over 0? So I know it's indeterminate. Uh, I'm sorry, I know it's undefined, and I know that there is no, no hope, but I have to plug in 0 from the left. The top is still 4, 
Zero from the left is negative 0.1, but this is still positive. Top is positive, bottom is positive, positive. Zero from the right, also positive. So I will write infinity and infinity. Even Yes, if you remember when we determined limits a long time ago for the uh, vertical asymptotes, um, limit from the left and limit from the right would be infinity, or at least one of them would be infinity. So I know it's a number over zero, which I know has no hope, but I have to find the sign of no hope by plugging in a number from the left. This is what we did in pre-calc, if you remember, but I didn't tell you what I was doing because we did not know limits then. So if you remember, we did this. We plugged this in the function, and then this in the function to determine the signs here. But at that time, we didn't talk about limits. We didn't know limits. Right. OK, so we're done. This is done. There's nothing else we can find there. OK, so now we have to differentiate. Let's differentiate the function. Now, we can differentiate this this and then we have to change it into a ratio or we can differentiate this which will take longer and factor and simplify let's do the other one so y equals x plus 4 times x to negative 2 every time I'm <clears throat> I'm uh, differentiating a ratio where there is a constant at the top and nothing else and x in the denominator, I recommend changing into a product. Mm -hmm. Unless you're comfortable with differentiating a ratio with the top being a constant. So now y prime equals 1 minus 8x to negative 3, which is 1 minus 8 over x to the third, which has to be changed into a fraction. What do we have at the top? Very good, over x to the third. So now you can, if you want, this is what I would like to do, factor, if you remember how to factor the difference of cubes. If you don't remember how to factor the difference of cubes, then just set it equal to zero and set the, uh, the numerator equal to zero because this is only always going to have complex solutions. Say, say, say that again. So if you don't remember how to factor this into this, you set this ratio equal to 0, and you solve the numerator set equal to 0. And you will get only one real solution anyway. So y prime equals 0 will result in x to the third minus 8 equals 0. x to the third equals 8, and you take the cube root. And you still get x equals 2 if you don't factor. If you do factor, you still get x equals 2. Because when you set this equal to 0, the only option is x equals 2. It's up to you. Is that better? The yes. No. We're finding the critical numbers. So we found the derivative. Now we have to set it equal to 0 to find critical numbers coming from f prime being 0. And also have to determine when the function is undefined when the derivative is undefined, but it doesn't matter because so is the function. So no critical number will come from f prime being undefined because when this is undefined, so is the function. Okay, so the only critical number is 2. The only critical number is 2. And now I have to study the sign of this expression, which is the derivative. That's why I prefer this notation. So uh, let me explain for a second. So the first derivative now is x minus 2, x squared plus 2x plus 4 over, I should write in the denominator x cubed. Well, I'm going to write it like this. Why? Because I know that this is always positive, and I don't want to waste my time with it. So this is just for the purpose of, this, of the sign. Because when I continue to differentiate, I'm not going to differentiate this. Because we need to determine the second derivative as well. 
Okay, so now it's a ratio. You can use the table to study the sign, or you can just plug in numbers. Yes? Can you explain that? Yeah, because I just changed the steps there. And I, I know, I know so I changed this, okay. Like so I changed x q minus 8. I ref I, we refreshed our memory on the difference of cubes last time. x q minus 8 is this times this. This is always a positive quantity no matter what. This will never be zero. It will always be positive. It has imaginary solutions. The denominator is x cubed, which could be positive or negative. So I split it into x squared and x because I don't want to waste my time with this. This is always positive and x squared is always positive. So the sign of the first derivative will be given by this expression only. So why would I focus on this when this is always positive and that's all I really need to get the sign. So when I come back, you can study the sign with a table as we did last time or just plug in numbers. On this side, I'm going to plug in negative 2. Negative 2 is negative. Negative 2 is negative. Positive. Now be very careful in each subinterval you have to plug in. So now let's see what happens with 1. With 1, the top is negative but the bottom is positive. And now let's see what happens with 10. 10 minus 2 over 10 positive. So you have to be very careful when you plug in numbers. Or I can show the other option of studying the sign of this if you want. The other option would be with a table. x is the variable in the problem. x minus 2. x is the next factor. And this is the ratio. x minus 2 over x. This we did in pre-calc a lot. So 0 and 2, 0 and 0, undefined, of course, and 0. Both are linear functions with a positive slope. That's why it's positive, negative, and positive. So you do this, and then you copy the sign here. Or you just plug in numbers, but you have to plug in numbers in, every, in each and every subinterval. Okay, now the moment of truth. Now I want to see that these two work well together. I have no idea yet. So I have to verify. Ready to verify? Okay. So from negative infinity to zero, the function, yes, that's not positive. The function is increasing. So is that supported by the sign of the derivative? Yes. 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 From 0 to infinity, yes. Is that supported by the sign of the derivative? Yes. Perfect. From, oh, I didn't put in a number here, sorry. So I have to plug in, so 8 plus 4 is 12 divided by 4, so this is 3. We have to plug in. We have to determine the y-coordinate one more time. It was 8 plus 4, right, which is 12 over 4, which is 3, correct? Okay, so from infinity to 3, what does this function do? Is that supported by the sign of the derivative? Good. And from 3 to infinity, what does the function do? Supported by the sign? Okay. So this is nothing, even if the derivative changes sign, because the function is undefined there. It cannot have a max min if it's undefined. It's a vertical asymptote. But this is very clear that point 2, comma 3 must be perfect. A local minimum. Wonderful. Very good. Yes? Yes, we don't know yet. Uh, it, it's in, it cannot be because, look, it starts from negative infinity. So this, yeah. So now let's study this, uh, the second derivative. Let's see what happens. It's not a friendly situation, but if I use this, if I use this, it's quite nice. See, I'm not going to use this or that, right? So I'm going to use this. So when I differentiate to find the second derivative, I have 24x to negative 4, and I definitely like this. Why? What is the sign of this expression? It's never 0. What is the sign of this expression? Right. 
<laughs> so I don't have to think at all. The function is not symmetric. I can write that f of negative x not symmetric. f of negative x does not equal f of x, and it does not equal negative f of x. So this is basically what we did in pre-calculus, but we did not know derivatives then and limits. Yes. Ready? All I care about is this. I don't want to see anything else. Anything else is in the way. So what do I have here? That the function increases to this point, crossing the x-axis at this point, going to infinity, opening upward. And then from positive infinity, it decreases to this, opening upward, and going back up to infinity. There is a slant asymptote, and there is a vertical asymptote. That's it. Exactly. So now, first I have to graph the asymptotes. There is no need to graph this because it's already in there. But I have to graph this, which is y equals x. So now I read my table. From negative infinity approaching the slant asymptote, it's crossing at negative 1.59, going to infinity on the left-hand side. On the other side, I have to have 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. The function is coming from positive infinity from the right-hand side of this vertical asymptote to a minimum and approaching the slant asymptote asymptotically. And this is it. Can we go back to show how we figure out the slant asymptote? Yes, we have to uh, determine the ratio, the quotient, the quotient oh. of the division. <laughs> so again, you can uh, check if you would like with the graphing calculator. I just want to show you how to put it in. Be very careful how you put it in. Let's say we want to put in the original function, which is x to the third plus 4, everything divided by, oh, of course, parentheses, x to the third outside plus 4, divided by, I put everything in parentheses, you know me, but you know that they, there is no need for parentheses if there is only one term. And the uh, graphing calculator will not graph the slant asymptote if you don't put it in yourselves. So I don't know, I already, I'm cheating here because it's the viewing window, it shows me whatever, but let's say I'm using zoom six, here it is, as expected. Okay, here's the minimum. In pre-calculus, we didn't know how to determine this minimum. We had to use the calculator, if you remember, and give it a left bound and a right bound. But now we do have the minimum. It's 2 comma 3. We calculated it. And this is the slant asymptote. Yes, Stephen? So I know before we had said that a normal like y-intercept or a horizontal asymptote. Say it again. So the, I we said like a horizontal yes, the horizontal asymptote is only for type 1 and type 2. Okay. Type 3 does not have a horizontal asymptote but a slant. So for a type 1 and type 2, yes. like a, a regular horizontal can be crossed. So yes, it can. can Very good slant. question. Very good. Yes, and slant as well. Yes. The one. only one that can never be crossed is vertical. Okay. But yes, a function can cross. Let me give you an example. So always remember, very good question, thank you. The horizontal asymptote, I cannot graph a line, this little piece here, and that little piece over there. I have to graph the whole thing, but it doesn't mean anything in the middle. It only says that the function eventually will tend to a number, but it doesn't mean anything in between, in the middle. It doesn't, horizontal asymptote doesn't mean anything. 
It only means that the trend eventually, when x approaches infinity, the function will approach 5 over there. And it will approach 5 over there. But in the middle, the function can cross the horizontal asymptote. It doesn't mean anything. Don't forget what you want to say. The same thing with a slant. It can't. The only asymptote that a function can never cross is the vertical one because it's undefined there. Yes, Joey? Sorry. Does the slope always have to be the leading coefficient over the leading coefficient of the top five? For, um, you mean for the? For the, the, the slope of the um, uh, Yes, yes. Because you have to divide and the leading coefficient will always be copied. Yeah. So is that clear, Stephen? So yes, so um, you, did I, no. So um, here's a function. So let's say it has um, a horizontal asymptote and it has a vertical asymptote and the function can do this. So it can cross. So obviously, the horizontal asymptote doesn't mean anything here. It's only this piece and this piece. But I cannot graph a horizontal asymptote, show you, you a little piece here and a little piece here. I have to graph the whole thing. Very good question. Yes. Um, we do have about seven minutes. And uh, I, we either do another problem um, or we go back to those two theorems from 4.2. Another problem, what type? Um, a graph of a function or another th a limit that you would like to practice with or... Oh. Uh, do you, would you like to choose? I, I mean, I can choose. You want me to choose? Okay, then. So either a graph or a limit. Okay, so I would like to look at something with uh, exponentials, like 51 on page 317. Because we only looked at rational functions and rational function with asymptotes and a, a rational function, function with same degree of the same degree, but we haven't looked at something like uh, y equals x e to negative 1 over x. I have not looked at this um, function. I have no idea what to expect. So I know I have to stop at 55. We have six minutes, and then we'll continue it if we don't finish it uh, right now. OK, so first of all, I'll say, mm, OK, this is nothing else but this. Obviously, this is never 0 because it's e to a number. Um, so the graph will never touch 0. However. Uh, I do know that this function is not defined everywhere. Where is this function not defined? Of course, because it's 1 over x. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Very good. Perfect. Good. I hope you agree that I cannot plug in 0. It's very clear. So this will never be 0. It will never have x, um, um, x intercepts or y intercepts. I cannot set this equal to 0 because the top will be 0, but it's undefined at 0. So I will have to determine this limit, this limit, this limit, and this limit. There is nothing else I can find about the function from the function itself, just for limits. So let's do that. Limit as x approaches negative infinity from x over e to 1 over x. Where does the top go? Good. Where does the bottom go? Careful. Uh, first, I have to look at the inside function, the inner function. 1 over x approaches 0. 
when x approaches negative infinity. And how much is e raised to 0? Good. So this is negative infinity. The other one on the other end, limit as x approaches infinity from x over e to 1 over x. Where does the top go? And where does the bottom go? Good. Perfect. Awesome. So now I want the left and right of 0. And this is it. That's all I can find. I can proceed with the derivative. So limit as x approaches 0 from the left from x over e to 1 over x. And then the other one limit as x approaches 0 from the right from x over e to 1 over x. OK, the top goes to 0. The bottom goes to 1. Awesome. So the answer is perfect. And the, the same thing here, right? Because um, 1 over x as x approaches infinity, that is infinity e to infinity, zero. Uh, e to infinity. So hold on just one second. So 0 from the right, so this is infinity. Careful. So here's the graph. Let's take a look at the graph of 1 over x. One second, one second. So 0 from the right is infinity. So e to infinity is e to infinity is yes. I know I only have one minute. I will, I know I won't. I'm not going to finish, so I'm not uh, going to rush. But we haven't finished. So. So 0 from the right, 0 from the left. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was looking at the, the other one. So it's negative infinity. So negative infinity. So e to negative infinity is 1 over e to infinity. And this is 0. So e to negative infinity, so it's 1 over infinity. So this is 0, right? Agreed? So it's 0 over 0. What do we do in the case of 0 over 0? So limit as x approaches 0 from the right, uh, left. The top prime is 1. The bottom prime is e to 1 over x times negative 1 over e, e, x squared. Or limit as x approaches 0 from the left of negative x squared over e to 1 over x. So uh, the top approach is 0. The bottom approaches. So 0 from the left again is a negative infinity, right? So e to negative infinity. Right? e to negative infinity is 1 over e to infinity, which is 0. So I have 0 over 0. Some of these, some of these limits, um, because I see where it's going. So it's going. See, initially I had x over e to one over x, and now it's more complicated into negative x squared over e to one over x. What do you think is going to happen next? It's going to increase. So uh, we may want to, if that's the case we may want to uh, um, look at this and, and see what happens left and right of, of 0 if it gets complicated or some other way. So we have to talk about it on Wednesday. So we can conclude just now. And we don't want to graph it with the graphing calculator. We want to analyze the function. We don't want to just jump into, uh, OK.